Hello, my name is Mark Evans. I'm uh, very proud to be an honorary fellow of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. Uh, my home is in Bewley near Inverness, but uh, I live and work here in Muscat in Oman, where if I look outside the window today, it's plus 43 degrees uh, Celsius, so summer is here uh, with a vengeance. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the lessons that I think we can learn from uh, explorers and expeditions about, um, about isolation and dealing with difficult and challenging circumstances and some of the things that we can learn from that. And the picture you see in front of you uh, right now was painted in 1851. And it's the Arctic Council, chaired by John Barrow, who was head of the Admiralty at the time. So these are Barrow's boys, Ross and others, who were planning the search for Franklin, who's been missing for a long time and hasn't returned. But the person I'm particularly interested in is uh, second from the left-hand side as you're looking. And uh, this is the same person as a younger Man. And, his, and his name is William Edward Parry. And Parry was an extraordinary man. In 1819, he set sail from London. He wasn't even 30 years old. And he was in command of two ships called the Heckler and the Griper. And the oldest book I have on my bookshelf here in Muscat is, is, now, is now getting on for... Um, 200 years old. It's an extraordinary book and it tells the account of Parry's efforts to try and become the first person to navigate the Northwest Passage and successfully and safely find a route over the roof of the planet to the Orient. Um, Parry was a brave man. At this time the Napoleonic Wars had come to an end. The British Navy was at its peak but too many men. No more wars to be fought. How did you progress as an officer amongst such competition. So you had to do something different. Parry was brave. He, he was second in command of an expedition going into the Northwest Passage a couple of years before his own journey. But he did something rather brave and that he challenged the decision of his commanding officer. And his commanding officer thought and was convinced that there was no way through and um, that it was solid ice wherever they looked. But Parry actually thought a lot of the ice was banks of fog. So he felt there was a way through, proposed his own expedition, was given the command of these two ships. And he set sail from London in 1819 with the command of over 90 men. Two years worth of supplies on these boats. The Donkins of London had just uh, come out with this newfangled thing called tinned food. No one had as yet invented tin openers. So it really was uh, learning as they, as they went. They mapped a lot of the archipelago of Northern Canada. They sailed from London to Leith, where they took on supplies and ballast. From Leith, they sailed north to Stromness, where they took on water and the final bit of coal. And from there, they headed northwest to the southern tip of Greenland, where they hooked up with the whalers, William Scoresby, and the people that really did know the state of the sea ice. And it seemed that in addition to Parry's great planning, good fortune was uh, shining upon him because the sea ice that particular summer in 1819 was very light. And so they made rapid progress. And if you look at a map of North Canada today, you will see that there are islands called Parry Island, named after him, obviously for his great achievement. Um, there are islands called Devon Island and Somerset Island because those are the counties where the best sailors came from at the time. And in latter years, a lot of the islands there and the peninsulas, the Boothia Peninsula, was named uh, by Felix, or after Felix Booth of Booth's Gin, for you gin lovers, because Felix Booth was one of the first commercial sponsors of, a, of, a, of an expedition pushed into it by, you know, or encouraged into it by Franklin's wife, who was desperately searching for Franklin. Further north from the Boothia Peninsula, you find uh, LF Ringness Island. Those of you who've been to Norway uh, will know that Ringness beer is one of, so again, there's a very strong alcoholic connection to the, no to the Northwest Passage because uh, Ringness also sponsored expeditions to search for Franklin. So a lot, of these, a lot of these islands were named by people like Parry, but most of them by Parry himself, a meticulous plan to map and to 
to name these items. And what better way to assure yourself of promotion but to name an island after the Lord of the Admiralty himself, because at the time that was Viscount Melville. So Parry, once he reached 110 degrees west of London, he started to accrue a daily bounty. That was the incentive for him and his men to keep pushing west, to be the first to find this route over the top of the planet. And they nearly did it. They were so, uh, so unlucky that just having the pursuit of science and mapping really did slow them down. And had they been able to keep going, um, they would have made it at the first attempt. Extraordinary, really. But uh, they sailed past this island that had no name. They mapped the coastline. Uh, and as they were progressing west, they were almost about to go over the top of Alaska and down to the Bering Straits. When the sea started to freeze around them, it was September. And so they did the wise thing. They turned back. They dropped anchor in uh, a small harbour that they called Winter Harbour. Uh, they named the island Melville Island and they prepared for a very long cold dark winter and this is where Parry's leadership came into his own because he knew that the battle would not be the severe cold and the four months of total darkness the battle would be lost or won in the minds of his men so he knew for them to cope with this isolation that routine was absolutely critical to keep the men occupied so the men had to leap over the side. The sea was freezing so quickly that they had to, chuck, they had to cut channels through the ice um, to make uh, a way for the boats to get them into a, a place of safe anchorage. And there they dropped anchor. The sea froze around them. They covered the boats with tarpaulins and they set about establishing a winter base in, um, in, in this winter harbour of Melville Island. An extraordinary story. Routine was key. Every morning you'd wake up in your hammock, you'd jump over the side of the boat onto the sea ice, you'd do your physical exercise to warm up, you'd jump back onto the boat, you'd have your ship, your, your gums would be uh, inspected by the ship's surgeon for scurvy, and, uh, and then you'd set about scrubbing the decks, having your breakfast, and then Parry's genius came to the fore. Because people may have laughed in London when he set off in 1819, but one of the last things to be carried on the boat was a barrel organ. And that barrel organ really did come to the fore and save the lives of his men because it kept them occupied. Every month they would have a theatrical production on the boat. Everyone would have their part to play. You'd have to learn your lines. You'd have rehearsals every day. And once that was done, the barrel organ would pipe up, God Save the King, and a load of other jigs and, 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 and dances and reels to keep everyone engaged, active, and focused. In addition to that, if you go to an antique bookshop in Scotland or in London you, uh, and ask for a copy of something called the North Georgia Gazette, because Parry also took a printing press. A lot of his sailors were illiterate, and if you find their signing on papers, you will find that they were signed with a cross. Um, but most of the officers were not, so to keep the officers inspired, they produced a monthly newspaper, and the one that you're looking at sold for over a couple of thousand pounds when it was auctioned in London. So it wasn't too many years ago that I took an expedition to Melville Island. Uh, so Parry kept all but one of his men alive. His leadership was extraordinary. Next year, the ice didn't really uh, thin out very much, so they had to turn around and head for home. But when you walk on Melville Island, it's incredibly flat. It's hard to work out what is land and what is sea when it's covered in snow. But, but when the sunlight did reappear in March, Parry set forth with his, with his men and they dragged a cart over land. And this was the forerunner of man hauling. So it was Scott and Shackleton uh, both copied Parry's um, style of using brawny, tough men to haul your belongings and uh, man haul them across a polar landscape. Every couple of days, they build a cairn. These cairns are not small. We all see cairns on the Scottish mountains. These cairns in, on Melville Island and throughout the Arctic are huge uh, because they were the beacons. If someone uh, was coming to search for you, that cairn was absolutely critical. You'd put something on top of it, a, a lime juice barrel. So these barrels that you see in, the, in this image in front of you right now, almost 200 years old uh, by the time we stumbled across it. And we used Parry's diary uh, to, to try and locate these. Melville Island still today is totally uninhabited by human beings. It's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. Um, we discovered that inside some of these cairns were metal canisters and we read 
Harry's diary, and, and he said he'd leave a parchment explaining exactly what he was doing and where he was planning to go next, in the hope that someone, should they come into difficulty, would um, come and rescue them. So we were uh, very excited to find a metal canister. I inside it was not Harry's original document, but uh, the Canadian Geological uh, Survey team had been here in the 1940s, 1950s, and had kindly made a copy of it, put it back into the canister, and had taken the original to Yellowknife uh, to sit in the museum. But it was very exciting for us to uh, reconnect with Parry in this way. We also found, uh, in, uh, close to Winter Harbour, the grave of the only man that died. And he didn't die of cold, he died of you know, something that nobody really knew. The ship surgeon cut him over and had a good rummage around. We couldn't find anything particularly bad. But the, 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 the headstone you're looking at, again, almost 200 years old, and chiseled out of rock by the ship's surgeon. Surgeons in those days were incredibly talented. People as they are today, but uh, a broader range of talents, I would suggest. Um, in Parry's diary, he referred to a rock to the southwest of Winter Harbour, upon which he sent uh, his, his, again, the poor overworked surgeon, to carve a, a record of their stay. And, and this rock has been early email, Facebook, social media by the British Navy in the Arctic Fleet for, for years. Anybody searching for Franklin, I think in this case, Kellett and uh, and McClintock in HMS Resolute searching for Franklin would leave a message of their of their time here. So, so our journey there was 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 an amazing expedition. We tried to find the cart that broke, and uh, and sadly we couldn't. But uh, we did find a little wooden hut that gave us some respite from the wind. And this hut uh, was pretty old, almost a hundred years old, and it was left there by a man called Joseph Bernier, who claimed these Arctic islands for Canada. Uh, early last century, and it was the Bernier uh, Medal that the uh, wonderful CEO of the uh, Royal Scottish Geographical Society, Mike Robinson, was presented when he was in Canada at the Royal Canadian Geographical Society um, uh, last year, I think, uh, and much deserved it was. But we slept in this cabin because it broke the bitterly cold wind, and uh, on our final night before the Twin Otters came to pick us up, we were very, very aware of footprints squeaking in the snow around our wooden cabin. No windows in the cabin. Uh, we had to saw blocks of snow to block the windows out. So we're lying in double sleeping bags. And uh, we can hear lots of footprints outside the hut squeaking in the bitterly cold temperatures on the snow. And uh, so clearly we thought polar bear. And so we had a, a rifle. We were about to shoot a hole through the roof of the, of the hut. But before we did that, uh, one of the team I was with said, uh, actually, there's more than one animal outside. There are several. So we thought we were in real trouble. And, uh, and, but we were in for the most magical moment because with us on Melville Island are not just polar bears and snowy owls, but the most extraordinary beautiful white wolves that have no fear of human beings whatsoever. So we spent a delightful two hours um, leaning out of the doorway of this hut that didn't have a door um, within meters of beautiful white arctic wolves. So Parry was an extraordinary man. The lessons of leadership in dealing with isolation were to pave the way for many future polar expeditions. And for him, the solution to isolation was creativity and routine. Unsurprisingly, he went on to do some extraordinary things later in his life. He has a crater on the moon named after him. And his record of closest to the North Pole, so about 10 years later, uh, he set off from the north of Spitsbergen with more of his tough marines. He converted rowing boats into um, sledge boats. So when you reached open water, you could row. And when you reached ice, the runners at the bottom, the men could haul. So he set off in June. He had no idea uh, what he would find because no one knew what lay beyond 75, 80 degrees north. But his men soon twigged, as did Parry, obviously. He was taken a fix on his sextant every night that actually, even though they'd been hauling north for 12 hours, they'd actually only moved a couple of miles. Something was wrong. So Parry it was who discovered the polar drift and the fact that the sea ice was drifting uh, southwards as fast as they were putting it. So fast forward a few years, 1912, the photo in front of you now, the Terra Nova, the Scots ship off Antarctica, dropping off six men to do some uh, to do some groundbreaking scientific research, the boat left them with six weeks' worth of rations, and uh, the boat sadly never came back because the wind changed direction, the sea ice blew up against the coast of Antarctica, 
and um, these men were left stranded for an entire winter. So, of course, the story that inspires many of us is, is the story of, of Shackleton, but of equal um, acclaim, really, should be the story of these six men, Scott's Northern Party. And they knew that their future lay in just creativity and, 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 and getting out of that wind to survive the dreadful Antarctic winter that lay ahead of them. Using whatever they had, they hacked out a, a simple cave in the ice. They slaughtered every seal and penguin that they could find because they knew that that was the only food that could sustain them through the winter. The cave was so small that it was impossible to stand up in. And um, they improvised a stove that used seal blubber to cook the food. So, so the menu was pretty limited um, and, and, and it was pretty slim pickings. And they stayed in this cave of ice for four or five months. It was horrific, yet they kept meticulous diaries. And the one man that really held them together is the man, um, second from the right as you look, um, Surgeon Commander Graham Murray Levick. And Mur Murray Levick's isolation was an extraordinarily moving experience for him. One of the men, understandably, went mentally deranged. They all look so oily in this photograph because that, that's the soot that came off the old blubber stone. This photograph was taken in the spring when the sun reappeared and they then headed off south. They made it to Scott's hut to find it was empty. The search party had gone out to look for Scott who hadn't returned from the pole. And you can imagine the shock of the search party when they returned to Scott's hut to find these six people who they'd given up for dead. But Murray Levick was so inspired by this that he set up the most extraordinary charity in London in 1930 because he believed People, and young people in particular, could learn a great deal about themselves whilst pursuing science in difficult circumstances. So this, this charity I benefited from as a young person when I was growing up. And, uh, and I led several expeditions for them, uh, myself trying to give back to uh, this wonderful thing that Murray Levick had set up. And uh, I led several expeditions to Spitsbergen. Um, and two of these were for four months. We'd fly up in... March, when the sun had just reappeared and the sea was frozen solid. And then we'd leave in July when the ice had broken up and the icebreakers could come in. And on each of these trips, I always take, I would always take very talented and motivated young geographers. Uh, and you can imagine the caliber of young people that applies for something like this. When you choose the creme de la creme, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary experience that you have in pursuit of science and inspiring young people. But I wanted to do something um, different and I wanted to spend an entire winter um, overwintering on Spitsbergen, on Svalbard as it's now called. So we managed to get support from IBM and uh, I remember going to Wimbledon, Wimbledon fortnight heavily supported by IBM. I met the head of IBM in the UK, he loved the idea and, and in August we set sail north to Spitsbergen and we lived for an entire year in small tents and four of those months were in constant daylight, four of those months were in total darkness and the rapid transition between. It was an extraordinary experience. We lived in a Lapish Lavu, a kind of wigwam, and that wasn't heated, so whatever temperature it was outside, it was the same inside. And whilst we were there for the first few months, it was pretty messy. Uh, the Arctic in summer uh, is a pretty messy place, lots of mud, lots of Lots of runoff, lots of meltwater, lots of rivers to be forded, pretty cold, but, but you, you adjust to the cold pretty, pretty quickly. And we had some super talented young people, many from Scotland. But slowly, slowly, we would see the sea, especially on calm days, starting to freeze over. And, and when that sea did freeze over, it enabled us to go on sledging journeys ourselves. Man hauling sledges much lighter than the cart that Harry's men dragged across. Melville Island in 1819, 1820, but it enabled us to, to have some extraordinary uh, journeys before winter set in. We must have been some of the last people on the planet to see images of 9-11. Uh, I think it was November when a helicopter visited us. We had to protect us from bears, the most extraordinary dogs, two 55 kilo Alaskan Malamutes, huge dogs who didn't like it when it got as warm and balmy as minus 10. They much prefer being outside in the bitter, bitter cold. And you could always work out the wind direction by looking at the way their backs were facing. 
But these dogs were protected, were there to protect us from bears, and they did a fantastic job. But soon the first group of young people left us, and there were just two of us left. And the photograph that you see now is taken in the depths of winter at 80 degrees north, 500 miles from the North Pole. This is Svalbard. And, um, and the photograph you're looking at is not taken by day, it's taken, of course, by night. Um, because it's a 24 hour night there. What you're looking at is not the sun, it's, it's the moon. And you can see some stars if you look around the moon. So, you know, despite the fact that it was totally dark for four months, um, we probably only got through um, two sets of head torches in four months. Such is the beauty of the landscape there. And um, before we embarked on something like this, of course, I spoke to people that, who, who, who lived there. And, and when you live in that environment, there's some pretty interesting characters who live on the edge of human tolerance. And, and our nearest neighbour was about 50 miles away, and he was a Norwegian called Harald Sulheim. Harold's last visitor had been Michael Palin, who was on his north uh, to south pole to pole expedition. And uh, so I asked Harold his, his advice on, you know, what should we be aware of if we come to overwinter here? You know, we were quite experienced. We've been to Svalbard quite a lot uh, in the spring uh, and summer, but never overwintering. And his advice was, well, you know, you have all the equipment, you, you know what to do. Uh, the, the battle will be mental, as it was with Harry's men. And my advice to you is just take your watch off and don't get so hung up with time because when it's dark all day, time just really doesn't matter. And he said, you will find yourself sleeping for longer than normal. You might sleep for 10, 11 hours at a time. Um, there won't be any daylight to wake you up. Your circadian rhythms are totally out of, out of kilter. But it really doesn't matter when you wake up. What is there to do other than shovel snow? and to make a cup of tea. But making a cup of tea takes about an hour and a half. Um, you have to chip ice out of the riverbed. You have to melt that ice. Then you have to bring that water up to boiling. So by the time you've done that, it's over an hour sometimes. And uh, so even the simple things take time, but digging, digging yourselves out is very important. Some of the tents we had there were, were used in Antarctica and they're very expensive. And to have to take a knife to the water of an incredibly expensive tent to cut yourself out because you're blocked in from the outside is, 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 is not, not a decision you want to take lightly. So, um, you know, we, we learned a lot there about, about how to cope in isolation and, and, and in particular having a more relaxed attitude at time. The, the sun did return every day. We'd walk to the top of the mountain and we'd look south at noon because every day after the shortest day, December the 21st, you would see a glow on the southern horizon and every day at noon that glow would get brighter and brighter until in February the mountain tops around us were lit by the little rising sun due to the south and that was a very emotional day for us uh, as we knew that every day now uh, it would, things would get lighter and things would get warmer and as things get lighter and warmer in the Arctic then you, the most extraordinary things are revealed and uh, and, and what is an Arctic wilderness, where the tallest tree is only three centimetres high, is, is, is riddled with wood. And this wood provided the inspiration for um, a, a recipient of the Livingstone Medal from the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, Wally Herbert, Sir Walter Herbert of Lagan, who became arguably the first person to cross the Arctic Ocean from Alaska to Spitsbergen. Because while he was kayaking on Svalbard many, many years before he attempted his Arctic expedition, and it was his use of isolation and time that enabled him to ask questions. And he asked the question that other people didn't. You know, he looked at this incredible driftwood on the beach and he said, well, hang on a minute, where's this wood come from? If the tallest tree on this Arctic island is only three centimeters tall, Where's all this wood come from? And this thing called the ocean currents and the drift. This wood, of course, had come from Scandinavia, far, far to the south. And then by asking himself the question and trying to work out the answer, Wally came up with a plan to set up camp on an ice floe and let that ice floe drift towards the pole in the polar winter, giving him a shorter journey to the pole himself. himself. And, of course, his plan worked beautifully. So isolation does give rise to inspiration. 
when you think and ask the right questions. If there's one book that defines the Arctic, it's uh, this book called Arctic Dreams by Barry Lopez. It's poetry. And if you spend time in the Canadian Arctic and European Arctic, you'll know exactly that, that Lopez has got it exactly right. And in it, he writes about something called the native eye. The Inuit have it, the Bedouin of the desert have it, but we in our modern lives have lost it. And by native eye, he means we're much more in tune with our surroundings. We're much more aware, we're much more observant of our surroundings. And, uh, and he, uh, he captured this, this idea of, of the similarities between snow and sand. And the landscapes are very similar. And for the last 15 years of my life, I've lived here in the Middle East in, in this beautiful country called Oman. And whilst Arctic Dreams is definitely the Arctic Bible, um, the book of desert travel is really Arabian Sands by Wilfred Thesiger, uh, a beautiful writer, a very talented black and white photographer who did several journeys across Arabia under the guise of trying to find the breeding grounds of the desert locusts. And, and ironically, this winter, not only has poor Oman been hit by falling oil prices, the way that Aberdeen is also suffering. We've also had COVID to deal with, but we've also had the biggest swarm of locusts in decades. So Thesiger's connections with Arabia are still very strong, even though he's now passed away. But Thesiger was not the first to cross the empty quarter. That mantle went to someone who's been very much forgotten. And, and a couple of years ago, I spoke to many of the groups of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society as part of the Inspiring People programme. And um, about a man who's been much forgotten. And he also has roots in Scotland. He was also awarded uh, one of the medals from the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. His descendants live today in southern Scotland. And uh, shortly after I started my research for this particular expedition that I wanted to do following his footsteps here in Arabia, um, someone alerted me that in Edinburgh his medals had been put up for auction. And one of those medals these medals that were auctioned uh, sold for over a hundred thousand pounds and the buyer was here in Muscat Oman and he's had those medals cleaned and one of those medals that you're looking at right now is the, the beautifully restored Livingston medal that was presented to this man called Bertram Thomas by the Royal Scottish Geographical Society in 1932 for becoming the first European to cross the biggest sand desert on earth. Thomas was an extraordinary man. He was a great linguist. Um, he learned Arabic very quickly and he had this great knack of persuading people to follow him into the unknown because the map of Inner Arabia at the time was terra incognita. According to the Explorers Club of New York, other than Antarctica, the heart of Arabia was one of the greatest challenges left for explorers to conquer. And Unlike Thesiger, uh, Thesiger was 20 years after, almost 20 years after Thomas. And unlike Philby, who followed, Philby made the mistake of asking for permission. Never ask for permission because you run the risk of someone saying no. Um, Thomas didn't ask anyone. He slipped out under the secrecy of darkness from Muscat, left his job behind, sailed to, to Salala in southern Oman, and there he assembled 40 camels, guides, food, and headed north into the unknown, an extraordinary journey, no way of contact with anyone. It took him 57 days. He had no idea where he was going to end up. He really was at the hand of his Bedouin guides. And uh, eventually they ended up in what is today the capital of um, Qatar, which is Doha. On the way, they captured incredible um, moving images and uh, include some of the earliest moving footage, black and white footage, obviously silent, of Southern Arabia. Thomas was the unknown explorer, really. He, um, he uh, his, his grave in Hill, a little village just outside Bristol, is, is a very humble grave. It took me all day to try and find it. And, and, I, and I then found his, um, then found his house, the, the local history society had left a plaque outside. And uh, it's extraordinary, really, how someone whose achievements made the front page of the New York Times, the Times in London, the Sydney Herald in Australia, it was groundbreaking news when Thomas made it across the desert. Um, 
but he's been hopelessly forgotten. Uh, and he passed away in 1950. So a few years ago, my most recent expedition was to really shine a light on this most extraordinary of men, to make sure that at least he got some recognition uh, and was not forgotten. So my own team, uh, myself and two Omanis, we um, left Salana on the same day, December the 10th, uh, about, uh, about 80 years later. And uh, we headed north following his route, of course, we had his diary. The difficulty was finding camels uh, that were tough enough to do what we needed to be done, because camels have gone soft these days. We had to train them uh, hard uh, to really um, to really stand any chance of, of keeping going. It took us 49 days to cross. We slept on the sand every night, uh, the most extraordinary journey in the most beautiful place. Um, but again, these connections to time, because as in the Arctic, our Norwegian trapper friend, Harold, who had advised us that we will end up sleeping for 12, 13 hours, you will end up waking up at two o'clock in the afternoon, but it just doesn't matter. That same challenge faced Thomas and later Thesiger when they did their own expeditions. Yes, they were with other people, but they were with other people whose cultures were incredibly different. At sunset every day, a fire would be lit, and both Thomas and Thesiger commented on how difficult it was to get time to themselves. They actually wanted isolation, um, because they wanted time to think um, and, and to juggle the million and one things that were going on in their mind, the, the incredible uncertainty. Would they find water tomorrow? Will they not find water? All the raiding parties that you had to avoid. So Thesiger was quite right. He said, you know, the, the, the Arab people are so sociable and, 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 and welcoming. They could not understand why you did not want to sit around the campfire and talk until midnight and then roll up and sleep in your blanket as the desert was bitterly cold. But Thesiger and Thomas would want to retreat to the top of a sand dune and just have time to themselves to think because they had to grapple with enormous frustrations as well. They both had in their mind a plan to start marching at six o'clock every morning whilst the sun was um, relatively cool and they could make as much progress as they could before the sun got too hot. So they thought that we would march for an hour, we'd stop for five, we'd march for an hour, we'd stop for 10, we'd march for an hour, we'd stop for five, and so we would break up the day and cover many miles. But the Bedouin people didn't see it that way. For them, they knew that the survival was based upon the camel, and you never knew when there would be grazing. And if there was grazing, you had to stop. So it would take hours sometimes to load 40 camels with all the provisions. And after 30 minutes, you might come over the crest of a dune and see green grazing in front of you because some localized rain, and then everything would have to be unpacked and the camels would be uh, allowed to graze and have their fill. And both Thomas and Thesiger initially found this incredibly frustrating, but soon they learned that actually their lives depended on the camel. So their own attitude to time became uh, much more flexible uh, and, and, and much more tolerant as, as things um, progressed. Both, uh, both commented, uh, and I think many of you listening to this who travelled amongst people, um, We'll say it's not just the beautiful landscapes that inspire us when we go exploring as geographers, but it's the people that make our journeys so special. And uh, this next video clip really was put together at the end of our 49 day journey after we'd reached Doha.
And my final, uh, my final message uh, really connects to yet another recipient of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society Awards. Because several years ago, in days when um, sails being used for polar travel were at a very early age, myself and a companion retraced the steps of Fritjof Nansen across Greenland, I think 1888 when Nansen set off from the East Coast. Again, an incredible thinker. Nansen outthought those who tried and failed. Other people had set off from the West to try to become the first people to cross Greenland. Um, they'd failed because again, the battle was lost in the minds of their men. When things became difficult, the easiest thing to do was to turn around and go back to salvation, to civilization, to the, to the, to the small settlements on the coast of West Greenland. Nansen was different. He was a deeper thinker than that. He knew that if he was dropped on the East Coast where there was no community, no settlement, the only way that you were going to survive was to keep pushing west over the ice. And that's exactly what he did. He designed rudimentary sails to, to harness the wind, to haul his Nansen sled, and he and his men trudging alongside on skis. And he became thereafter the first man to successfully cross uh, the Greenland ice cap. And um, for Nansen, um, isolation was a wonderful thing because he came up with this incredible quote. Uh, it was sometime in the 1890s when the Royal Scottish Geographical Society gave Nansen, I think is the highest award, the gold medal for his great achievements in crossing Greenland. Because Nansen was to go on to much greater things. He was become a great diplomat, he became a Nobel laureate. And he came up with this great saying, which essentially says that really, we all need to find time to think. The solutions will not come from people who are too busy. We can't think about too much deeply when we're so busy. And for me, one thing this lockdown and isolation has given is time to think. And on our Outward Bound courses, whether you're doing that at Fort William, at Outward Bound Scotland, or here in Oman, we build in something called the solo. When Kurt Hahn set up Outward Bound at Gordonston many years ago, the solo, a young person finding time to actually sit down and think about what it is that I've learned, how do, how do these how do these lessons I've learned make sense and how am I going to use them for a better future? And therefore, I would like to end by leaving that thought with you. How can you learn your own? Uh, what can you learn from your own isolation um, for a better future? Because there are many, many models that we can look at from explorers in the past to guide us. Thank you for listening.